Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm the Portfolio Manager with TRICOM. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider Webinar Series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to the staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Wilson Cole. For more than 20 years, Wilson has been the engine for Adams, Evans, and Ross and has helped thousands of staffing and recruiting firms all over the world collect well over $1 billion in staffing and recruiting debt. To commensurate that milestone, Wilson was named the Billion Dollar Man by the editorial staff at Recruiting and Staffing Solutions Magazine. He was also awarded the Lifetime Contribution Award from the United States Staffing Association for his years of contribution to the staffing and recruiting industry. Wilson has also been recognized by Inc. Magazine for being the CEO of one of the 500 fastest growing privately held U.S. companies. For more than 20 years, Adams, Evans & Ross has grown to become the nation's largest credit and collection firm for, that specifically collects for the staffing and recruiting industry. Over the years, their collection process has been perfected to ensure maximum results for their clients at competitive rates. To a staffing firm, timely receivable payments are the lifeblood that provides strength and energy needed to fuel operational cash flow. Non-payment from a client can quickly diminish cash flow and drain the necessary resources your firm needs to effectively operate. In today's Industry Insider webinar, our guest speaker, Wilson Cole from Adams, Evans & Ross, will walk you through the seven deadly collection mistakes, how to avoid these mistakes, and how to protect your receivable assets. By the end of this session, you'll know how to position your staffing firm with safeguards to protect the receivable assets essential to your business. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Wilson. Well, thank you for having me. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, depending on where you're, you're located, I'm Wilson Cole, and I'm, of course, president of Adams, Evans, and Ross. We have a tremendous amount of ground that we're going to try to cover today, and this is going to kind of be a helicopter or a broad view of, uh, of what you need to do. Keep in mind, on all of these seven topics, we typically do a webinar-based uh, pretty much solely on each one of these topics, but we're going to kind of give you an overview so you guys uh, at least have a, a better understanding of, of what you need to do and the kind of systems that you need to put in place whenever you're, you're extending credit. Now, everybody that uh, stays uh, with us on this webinar, uh, at the end I'm going to give you uh, uh, information on how you can get two free business credit reports if there's a company that you're just unsure of or a new company uh, that, that maybe you're, you're talking to, we're going to give you the ability to be able to pull up a commercial credit report on those particular companies. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, but let me first also say we're going to discuss tons of information. We're going to discuss credit risk. We're going to discuss uh, things that, uh, you know, how to become a secured creditor. It's informational in, uh, in uh, nature. Uh, specifics, if you have a specific legal question, give me a call and I can give you a referral over to one of our forwarding attorneys in the state in which you live because what may happen and or what may uh, be correct in the state of, uh, of Florida may not necessarily be the case in Montana or Massachusetts or California. Uh, so this is an overview. For the most part, these are just going to be pretty much universal uh, safeguards, uh, but this is something that, that you do want to look at. If you have a specific question, I'll try to answer it for you, but when it comes to legal advice, I'll have to refer you over to one of our referring attorneys. So, you know, after doing this for 23 years, um, it, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, it, it's truer now than it was when we first created this webinar probably 15 years ago. Uh, 
you guys make the same mistakes, and and they're the the same repeated mistakes. That if you just made a few adjustments, you you could um, you, you could greatly reduce your risk. Um, because let me kind of start off this this uh, webinar with asking you a question, and that question is this: If somebody were to pick up the phone and call you, and they were to say, "Hey, I'm a really good guy. I'd like for you to loan me fifteen thousand dollars," you would. Uh, you know, and they said, gee, I'll pay you back in 30, 45 days. You'd laugh, you'd hang up, you'd pick up the phone, tell a friend uh, about this crazy call that you just received. But I, I want to point that out to you. That, in essence, is what you do every time that you send out staffing. Now, you're, you're probably seeing fairly de decent returns on it, as you should, but you need to realize that, especially in this market as it's changing now, uh, and we're starting to see balances uh, just grow at extra, you know, just amazing uh, uh, rates uh, where they were just from a few years ago, in my opinion, because uh, of the different government regulations. Staffing is being utilized more now than ever. Well, the, the downside to that is you're loaning out more money now than ever. So let's go ahead and get started. And, and like I said, each one of these topics we, we teach free webinars to the industry, um, and if you send me your um, email address at the end when you get your free credit reports, I'll make sure that you get on our list of, on these free webinars that we do once a month. But the biggest mistake that, that you guys do is you fail to check credit. Um, you know, there again, that, that example I just used, if somebody picked up the phone and called you, you'd extend out credit, you'd send out your people, and you may or may not check. So you definitely want to pick up uh, and check credit. You don't need to utilize just one resource for checking that credit. You know, I recommend that you get three trades, you, you get the uh, credit application, and you check the three trades in the bank because it's going to give you information that a commercial credit report is not going to give you. Also, and we're going to discuss why you want to go ahead and get those three trade references um, and um, in bank for a later date uh, that we're going to discuss here in just a, in a few minutes. But you need to check credit. The commercial credit reports, whether you utilize Corterra, whether you utilize us, whether you utilize uh, Dun and Bradstreet, they're going to be limited to the extent of uh, they're going to let you know if there's open lawsuits. They're going to let you also know if they're not paying their primary vendors uh, well. Because when was the last time that you had a, um, a, a company that you were extending out credit to and then they started paying you slow? Let's say they were paying you at 60 and 90 days. You don't typically pick up the phone and call Dun and Bradstreet and say, hey, this company's paying me slow. What typically happens is you turn it over for collections or you sue them, and then Dun and Bradstreet will pick up on those. Experian will pick up on those. You guys are what we call a third-tier debt. That's where you're going to show up in their transportation company, their printing companies, their you know, janitorial services. Those are going to show up. If, if they're a computer manufacturer, they're going to pay their circuit board members or their circuit board vendors. If they don't, they're out of business, or uh, they'll jump over to another uh, vendor. But that vendor, assuming that it's a larger company, those are going to be the ones that show up under Dun & Bradstreet. So you want to be able to check uh, on the um, you want to be able to check on the um, credit reports to see if they've been turned over a place for collections, but you still want to check those applications, check the three trades, the banks, and things along those lines. Now, the second biggest mistake that you guys fail to make is you don't ever get contract signed. Uh, staffing firms are a little better at, uh, at getting timesheets signed than they are employment agreements, so there's a couple of things that I want you to do. Number one, you need to get terms and conditions signed, and what better way to do that than to uh, do a, a credit application where when they sign off, they're agreeing to your terms and conditions. So there's some safeguards that you can build into the back of that credit application, and that's another reason why we want you to check credit, because at the very beginning of the relationship, you are no more, you're, you're, you're at the most likely to get 
the the paperwork signed. I can tell you that in six months, if the company's behind and they're they're uh, uh, left you or they've run up a huge bill and and uh, you're turning them over to collections, they're not going to sign anything at that point. So what you want to do is you want to get the safeguards built into your uh, agreements, into your credit applications, and into your timesheets. Now, if they are not on the timesheets, then very quickly the next time that you go and you have, if you're using paper uh, sheets, uh, timesheets, then make sure that the safeguards that we're going to discuss are on the back of that uh, application. Now, what I'll also do in addition to giving you the two free credit reports for everybody that stays on, on the conversation with us, I'll, I'll let you know how to get our free credit application. And it has some of these safeguards built in uh, to where you can kind of see the outline and some of the things that you may want to check with your local attorney on. But you need to get contracts signed because all of the safeguards that we're going to talk about, you know, I have a lot of clients say, well, my invoices say I can charge, you know, for collection fees and I can charge for interest. In all states, if they did not sign off on something giving them permission or giving you permission to charge them interest, collection fees, and all of that, every single attorney that we have utilized in all 50 states tell us the same thing. You're not going to be able to ask for it in the court. So you have to have something that they sign off on, giving them permission, where you can charge them interest and things along those lines. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about also is you guys fail to get personal guarantees. And I'm going to go into detail at the very end on, on just why that is incredibly important with some statistics. But you, you fail to get personal guarantees, and I realize if you're dealing with a large uh, company, um, you know, if you're dealing with Coca-Cola, nobody's going to sign a personal guarantee. But if you were dealing with somebody that has been in business less than two years, I would always, always, always get a personal guarantee signed. Uh, it, there again, if you go into your bank to set up a credit line, you go to a funding company, they're always going to have these things uh, where, where you sign off on because that's that's just the way business is practiced. And so you need to realize that you're loaning out money. And so if they've been in business less than two years, what you want on the personal guarantee is you want it to be kind of off in its own separate section. And the most incredibly important part of that is make sure that they do not sign their title. If somebody signs John Smith president, it just voided out your, your guarantee because your argument's going to be it's real clear that they signed as an officer. If you have it to where they sign on the back of the agreement, you know where they sign everything else, and you just try to bury a personal guarantee in there, it typically isn't going to float. You want it kind of off to its own. On that uh, credit application that we had talked about that we'll make sure you get a free copy of, um, go ahead and, uh, and request it. What we'll do is we'll make sure that you get it because it has our sample of a personal guarantee and how we like to see it uh, kind of held off to its own. So you want to make sure that the personal guarantee is separate, but you also want to make sure that when they do sign it, that they don't sign their title to it. And that's that's kind of probably the eighth thing that you guys don't do as well as I'd like to see you do is have a systematic review to make sure that you have everything signed. I'm going to give you, as we go through these, these seven mistakes, you need to have somebody in your company that's held accountable to make sure that each client has all of the information that, that you need, that they have everything on file that is successful because I cannot tell you how many times I have a conversation with somebody when it comes into collections and they say, yeah, they signed off on all of our terms and our agreement and credit app, but we stuck it somewhere and we have no idea where it is. That That's almost like not even going, why, why go through the motions if you're not going to have a system that can track it. Um, what a lot of, what we do here internally over at Adams, Evans, and Ross and, and pretty much all contact manager uh, solutions have it is those important documents uh, upload and, and keep a copy uh, attached uh, in the attachment records of your CRM. It's, it makes it so much easier to go ahead and, um, and track it down. 
So make sure that you get personal guarantees signed on any company that's less than two years old or any company where you're extending you know, a lot of credit to, and we're going to discuss that here in just a moment. And that is you fail to set credit lines. You know, somebody could be an absolute wonderful $5,000 credit risk, but a horrible $50,000 credit risk. Imagine if you went to your bank and your bank said, well, gee, how much do you need? And you say, okay, I need, you know, $10 million. They're going to laugh you out of the place because most companies are a horrible $10 million credit risk. But if you say, you know what, I need, you know, $25,000, 50000 100000 you know, quarter of a million, whatever that is, your chances are pretty, pretty uh, uh, much better improved than asking for $10 million. You need to set credit lines based on your client's ability to repay you, not on your client's needs. Let, let me repeat that again because that is insanely important and it, and it is pretty much contradictory to any actions that most of our clients and staffing firms make, is you need to set credit lines based on your, your client and your debtor's ability to repay you, not based on your client's need. You know, if somebody picks up the phone and they say, you know what, I need, you know, 25 temporaries a, a week, uh, everybody gets excited, they're high-fiving, they send the, the folks out there, and they don't check credit, or they say, hey, yeah, it looks like they are paying some some some, uh, some people, so they must be a good credit risk. Nothing could be further from the truth. And this is something <clears throat> that I really do recommend that you um, – that you uh, – sign up for one of our webinars on how to set credit lines, but let me give you a quick overview. First thing you want to do on setting credit lines is break your clients into three categories, A size, B size, and D size. This isn't about, uh, or C size, this is not about, uh, um, uh, not about um, how they pay their bills. This is on their physical size of their company. If they're a publicly traded company, Coca-Cola, GM, things along those lines, they're probably not going to be a credit risk. You have to kind of manage cash flow because larger companies pay you uh, a little slow, but they're typically not a credit risk unless you're dealing with an Enron or something along those lines. Then you have your B-sized companies. Those are going to be your regional companies. That's going to be like your large regional dealerships or large grocery stores that are regional or just mid to, to large, probably still publicly traded, or if they're not just their their icons in your your industry, then 80% of of all the businesses that you deal with are going to fall into the next category, and that is your C size. And this is going to be for closely held, family run businesses. And um, bear with me, I'm going to take a sip of water. My apologies on that. I have been flying um, for the last two weeks, and um, I have lost my voice from being on the plane so much. Uh, but anyway, um, well, we're catching colds and all that good stuff. But um, what you want to do is on the credit lines, um, on those C-size companies, they can be insanely profitable companies. They can be amazingly profitable companies in great credit risk. The problem that you run into is they may be built on two or three primary clients where if they lose one, there's a significant cash flow. Or... It could be where, you know, the parents leave the business to their children and the children didn't inherit the same skill set that mom and dad have, and they turn the business into a bank, or they sell the business to somebody else, and in essence, you're really just dealing with a new business that probably used some type of leverage to buy out the company, so there, there may not be a lot there. But what you want to do is you want to pull up those three trade references that you get from the credit application. You want to see how they're paying that particular company. And if you have you know, companies that they're paying $20,000 to, $10,000 to, you know, $80,000 to, that's fine. But in most cases on these C-sized companies, you're going to see where they're paying somebody $5,000, they're paying somebody $20,000, and they're paying somebody $30,000. And then you want to check their bank. And once you check their bank, then you can start trying to set some, some credit lines. And a lot of banks have turned absolutely cowardly on, on that, where they won't rate a bank. Some will, some won't. But when you call the bank, you say, hey, I want to verify a, a 
uh, a checking account, you give them the name, and they'll typically say they're satisfactory or they're not satisfactory. Some will still rate it. They'll tell you, well, they have a high four, which means they have a high four-figure average. They have a mid-five, which means they have a mid-figure uh, uh, in there, or they have a low six, which means they have six figures. Unfortunately, a lot of banks won't give out that information as freely as they used to. Hopefully, the ones who you're calling on will. But if they don't, all banks typically have a merchant check line. So if you call in on a merchant check line, you may need to do this over three or four weeks, but see if a $1,000 check is clear, see if a $10,000 check is clear, see if a $50,000 check is clear. And you'll start kind of getting a gauge on how much, um, you, you know, how much you're carrying in the account. Once you get that information and you take a look at the credit at lines that they're getting from their other vendors, then you can start setting credit lines. Now, what I always do is, you know, say get an average and then figure, you know, be in that top. You know, you don't ever want to be the one that owes the most uh, with a company. So if their average uh, creditor is, you know, giving them $20,000 uh, on um, in credit, I'd say somewhere between 60 and 80 percent is all I'd want to give out to them, assuming that they have the money in the bank. If somebody is only carrying $2,500 in the bank and they're running up $10,000 a month with you, mathematically it's now impossible for them to ever pay you off. So you need to have those two informations or those two, two pieces of information to set credit lines. Now, like I said, I, I do recommend at a later date you guys join us because we have some tools where we can – we even have a, a credit line calculator that kind of gives you an average. But the biggest thing that I want you to walk away from this particular mistake is set credit lines and have safeguards to where if somebody has a $5,000 credit line and they're up to – you know, 4,900 or they're up to 5,500 and they may not be past due, <clears throat> but you can pick up the phone and call them and say, look, you're over your credit line. We need to go ahead and give a, get a check in. And if they say, well, gee, you know, we can't get a check in, then, then, um, you can maybe negotiate for personal guarantees or, or some, some type of other security that we're going to talk about, uh, going forward. But you want to, set credit lines because imagine if you went off on vacation or you know anyone went off on vacation and your credit uh, credit card said you had a five thousand uh, dollar line of credit and all of a sudden you're at twenty thousand dollars credit card companies just simply cut you off so it ceases to work you need to have some type of system that catches that as well the other thing that you guys do and, and this is the most frustrating part with dealing with clients that I, I know are very shrewd business people. Almost everyone does this. Everybody fails to recheck credit, and especially on those C-sized companies. On those C-sized companies, I want you rechecking their credit every six months to 12 months. I want you to dust off that credit application, and I want you to – uh, go back and recheck the three trades, see what their bank is, pull up a commercial business report, see if they're being sued. Because here's the thing about the trade uh, application of the credit reports where the trade uh, uh, vendors are. You and I both know that if they give you three trade references, unless they're absolute morons, they're people that they're paying right now. The uh, trick is in six months, that may not be the case. So if you start seeing where they're <clears> – <throat> paying you a little slower, then you can go back and check that credit and see how they're paying the other one. So there needs to be some safeguards where you can go back in every six months, at least every year, dust off that trade uh, trade report and our, our trade application, credit application, and re revisit the vendors. Also, something that absolutely amazes me, uh, something that you guys don't do, and in my opinion, this is in, in line with the uh, uh, credit applications, is Google the company's name. You know, we run through all, um, all companies that come through. We run them through our credit screens. We pull credit reports. We want to see who and what it is that we're dealing with before we have that first contact with them. Because it starts setting the table, and it also fits into about 10 different profiles that we've developed. So we know what's going to get it collected, probably, you know, will give us a higher probability of getting it collected. 
one of the things that we do is we Google the company. And most of the time we don't pull up anything. Occasionally we will pull up weird stuff that uh, uh, it just bizarre, bizarre, bizarre stuff. And so if you were dealing, you know, we, we had, uh, you know, one of uh, uh, our, our clients uh, turn over somebody when we ran the guy's name. I mean, the waiting trial for fraud and, I mean, just, just weird stuff. And it gets much weirder than that. So Google the company, at the very least, Google the name of the company that you're dealing with. And, and set up processes to where you're there every 12 months, at least on C-size companies. On the Coca-Colas of the world, you know, you know if you see something where Coca-Cola stock's tanking or you know, somebody along those lines, you may want to reevaluate, but you don't have to check those as often. B-size, you know, kind of keep your ear to the ground. On C-size, closely held corporations, um, those are the ones that you want to make sure that you stay on top of. Another thing that you guys fail to do is to become a secured creditor. And if you've ever gotten a bankruptcy notice, you'll get um, a sheet of paper that has secured creditors and it has two to ten people listed. Then you have this novel of unsecured creditors. Guess what? You're an unsecured creditor. You can try to claim, gee, we're a function of payroll. No, at the end of the day, you're an unsecured creditor. Uh, in 23 years, uh, we've had uh, some of our forwarding attorneys and tons of clients try to argue through the bankruptcy court that they were a uh, uh, function of payroll, therefore they should be treated differently. And I have yet in 23 years seen where the bankruptcy court says, oh my goodness, you poor staffing firm here, let me, uh, let me make sure you get to the front of the line. What we see more often is there's a clawback period. And so there's a 90-day period. If a company goes bankrupt, anything that they have paid you within the last 90 days becomes subject and typically does get asked back. Uh, you get asked for it back from the bankruptcy court. And I, I can't tell you how many times I have clients call me. They say, Wilson, I had a company file bankruptcy on me you know, six months ago. Now the trustee's telling me that $40,000 check that they paid me uh, you know, at, at, at 90 days or, you know, 75 days, I've got to give back. And before you just blindly cut the trustee a check, uh, give me a call. I can give you a referral over to one of our forwarding attorneys that handles that. But on the same note, don't ignore it because they, they can put some teeth into that request. But <clears throat> to become a secured creditor, basically all you have to do is to file a UCC-1 form with the courthouse in the debtor's location. But the caveat to that is he has to give you permission to be able to file that uh, secure uh, interest. It's basically UCC1. And the way that we suggest that you do it is bury it, the wording in the back of your credit application. And there's a, a magical phrase, it's about a half a paragraph, that gives you permission to have this uh, UCC1 filed with the courthouse. Now, it's a fairly easy form to send in. I always recommend that our clients um, have a local attorney, <clears throat> excuse me, or a service do it, because um, at that point, if they don't perfect it or if they don't file it right, then at that point, you at least have some uh, errors and omissions insurance that you can, can go after. But to become a secured creditor, it's almost like a, a mortgage. Whoever files it first is first lien holder. Whoever files it second is second lien holder, third lien holder, and what have you. It doesn't guarantee that you'll get paid. But what it does do is if, they, if you're the second lien holder in there and you're the second one to have filed a UCC-1 and they go bankrupt and they owe uh, you know $10 million and they have uh, – you know, $18 million in assets, you're going to probably get paid. Secure creditors are going to get paid first. First one's going to get paid. Anything left over, you get paid after you, then the third, and so forth and so on. To become a secured creditor is one of the, the easiest things to do and one of the smartest things to do because they cannot sell their business unless secured creditors are paid off. They can sell their business to anyone they want, sell off the assets and not the liabilities to anyone they want. In, in unsecured or open, uh, open account, creditors don't get paid. I mean, they, they sell the assets to the new company. It moves on. If you've been in business uh, for any amount of time, you know, then certainly in the last five or six years, I'm sure you've seen that. 
had you filed a, uh, uh, a UCC-1 with the bank, can guarantee you would have gotten paid, but you would have stood a much better shot in before they could have sold off those assets, they would have had to address and, and, and rectify that situation. Now, you cannot just file a UCC-1 anytime that you won't if you do not have the signature. So you have to get uh, in the terms and agreements, you bury it in that credit application and assuming that the owner or somebody with perceived authority signs off on it, that is how you become a secured creditor. Now, we teach an entire webinar on how to be a secured creditor. That's just a, a very rough overview, but at least it gives you a conceptual understanding. Because would I do it for somebody that owed me 5000 It's probably not worth it. But we have had companies come in here with $150,000, $200,000 in open account, and they're not secure. Why anyone would loan $200,000 out to a company and not be a secured creditor is, is beyond, beyond reason and belief. Because I can assure you, if you go to the bank and you borrow pretty much, I mean, even at $5,000, they are going to probably uh, file it. But if you go and, and you borrow uh, uh, money from a bank for your business, I can assure you it's not something they're going to openly tell you, hey, here's what we're doing. But I can assure you they filed a UCC-1. That's, that's what banks and lending institutions do. The other thing that you fail to do, and this is kind of a, a catch-22 because it has some benefits, it has some safeguards. As a general rule for staffing firms, and this is, this is a collection statement, not a legal statement, uh, from, uh, from a collection standpoint, I really like to see uh, jurisdictional clauses in, uh, in, in your agreements. I don't, I don't like it as much in, with recruiters because it creates some logistics issues for us. Because if, if the recruiter's in one state, the debtors, you know, all of their assets are in another, and you sue them in your state, you still have to domesticate the judgment, and you have to go to their state anyway. But let's assume that you have uh, a company that has multiple you know, offices, and they come to your uh, office or come to your city, and, and so they you supply staffing. And let's assume that they shut down or that um, office is headquartered in California and you're in, in Florida, but they have a branch there in your office. Technically, the argument could be that you have to go to where the corporation is headquartered to sue them. Well, let's say it was a little transient or things on those lines. The jurisdictional clause allows you to sue in your state, and if they have assets in your state, then you can attach those assets. And those assets are bank accounts, you know, receivables, things on those lines. If they are uh, all of their assets are in another state, then you have to go to that other state and domesticate that judgment, which from a collection standpoint means that we have to get two attorneys involved, which means a lot of times that we're not able to get it collected on a contingency basis where the attorneys collect only if they collect, uh, but uh, they want to charge a, some type of small retainer because they have to wind up splitting their fee with another another attorney. That That's a... That is a, a uh, uh, topic for another discussion. But the neat thing about a jurisdictional clause also is if your temporary were to do something, let's say they run a, uh, uh, let's say you have somebody come in and they're you know, supplying staffing and your temporary runs a forklift off of the, um, uh, off of the loading dock and it hurts somebody or, or hurts you know, or just tears up the equipment. Typically, your errors and emissions insurance is going to handle that type of stuff anyway. But if there is a dispute, I would much rather, if somebody were going to sue uh, our company because there was a dispute, I would much rather handle it in my backyard than handle it in their backyard. So if you have a jurisdictional clause they and they sign off on it, then the state or the county in which you reside is where uh, where jurisdiction would, would have to be handled. And that just winds up saving you a lot of frustration if it gets to that point. And a lot of times it can help you get it paid. Uh, once you sue them, they don't want to come to your state and fight it, so they go ahead and pay it. Now, let's discuss uh, a couple of statistics, and we're kind of burning through some, some time here, and I want to make sure that we leave a little bit of time open for questions and answers. But I do want to give you some some sobering statistics, and this is why you need personal guarantees on new businesses, 
but this is also why if it's on larger balances you need to uh, make sure that you're a secured creditor and why you need to recheck credit. Everybody has heard the statistic that's been in business, 80% of businesses will fail within the first two years. And, um, and so if a company's been in business less than a year and they come to you and say, Mr. Staffing Firm, we want you to pr provide staffing for us, and oh yeah, I'm not gonna sign a personal guarantee, if he's not willing or she's not willing to back up the business, then why the heck would you be? And keep in mind, you've got an 80% shot that this company is going to go out of business in, in two years. But here's another sobering stat: out of the out of the 20% that do survive, okay, so 80% fall by the wayside. The 20% that do survive, 80% of those will collapse over the next five years. So once you start getting past, you know, seven, eight, ten years, the, and there again, you still run into where if they leave it to their children, they sell the business, those dynamics change. But where you have consistent ownership that's over seven years, credit starts improving. But under that seven-year mark, 80% uh, are going to fail in the first two years, and the survivors, 80% of those are going to fail in the next uh, five years. So... The, the biggest takeaway that I can give to you is don't look at it as you're just uh, extending or that you're you're giving people staffing. You are actually loaning money. So you need to view it as though you're loaning money. So anyhow, I'm going to pass it back over to Tricom. I, I know that the, um, uh, the uh, message – uh, section or the uh, instant message was over on her side, so she had some questions for me, so I'm going to hush up so she can ask me the questions. Okay. Um, I had a couple questions that came in, um, one of which is, what specific questions should you ask a trade reference? One of the specific questions is you want to ask them several things. Number one, what's the high credit? So what's the most that they've, they've lent, lent out, and is that 10000 5000 100,000, whatever it is, do they pay within terms? What are your terms? Because if they're giving them 90-day terms, uh, and in that industry they feel like that's you know that's a good thing. If, if somebody wanted to go 90 days on staffing, uh, most folks would, would have a heart attack. Uh, so ask them what their terms are. Have they stayed within terms? And um, what is their average balance? that they, they have, because their highest one may be $100,000, but typically they hover around you know, $20,000, $30,000, $40,000, whatever that case may be. Also, have they ever received any NSFs? You know, um, in 23 years, there's been companies that have come through that are cre good credit risk, and, they're, and occasionally they may bounce a check, but at the very least, a bounce check is it shows that they have severe cash flow issues. If somebody has bounced a check to a company, then you kind of want to dig a little little deeper. So you do want to know what the average credit line is, what's the maximum credit line, what the, what the term is, and have they ever bounced a check. Okay. And can I become a secured creditor without their signature? No. Uh, basically, we've had some clients that have sat on our webinars, and then you know, six months, eight months, ten months down the road, they wind up having somebody into them for a hundred thousand dollars, and they say, you know what, Wilson said, you know, that's a great way to do it. Yeah, we don't have a signature. Let's see if we get called on it, and they did get called on it, and 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 that can create some real issues for you uh, if you uh, have not gotten the uh, forms with the magical words and I mean and it's literally a paragraph that you know, basically says you're going to hold a secured interest on you know uh, all open you know accounts and it, and it, and it like I said it, it's it's uh, just kind of going through it, it, it lists kind of a, a blanket uh, UCC1 statement that uh, if they have not signed off on that uh, then then do not do it because here here's the issue. We've had uh, two attorneys, uh, as they, the debtor was coming through collections, both of the attorneys were trying to sell the client's businesses and assets. When they got to the point, and they were in collections, and they found out that our client had filed a UCC-1, 
one client had uh, done all the, you know, had, had done it correctly, and the attorney was mad. He says, well, we may threaten litigation, we may sue or whatever. Then he came back and says, that's going to take too much time. We'll pay 80, uh, 85% of what we owe, and that forget it was like 20 grand. The other client, and, and by the way, our client got paid. Uh, the other client tried to be cute after the fact and, and, and file a UCC-1, and they almost got sued for damages because the other company wasn't going to buy the assets, and so this company could claim, gee, you cost them a gazillion dollars because they couldn't sell off their assets and stiff everybody. Uh, but if you don't have permission to do it, you cannot file a UCC-1. And it's a fairly simple form, but you have to have that wording to do so. And is that secured creditor language in that free credit application that you had mentioned earlier? Yes, it is. And, and, and uh, what I'd like for everybody to do is email over to me, uh, send it to wilson at aeremail.com. That's wilson at aeremail.com. Put free credit uh, application and credit report. Just put it in the subject. What I will do is I will forward it over to uh, our client services, and then they will email you back. If you get it to me today, then probably sometime late this afternoon or in the morning, all of that will be sent over to uh, over to you. And then also what I'll do is I'll request that they automatically put you in our webinar notices to where if you guys want to be part of a webinar where we're going to discuss in detail how to become a secured creditor, in detail how to set credit lines, then, then you'll certainly have that option. But just email wilson at aeremail.com uh, and um, just put in the subject free credit report and credit application, and I'll make sure that you get it. Okay, fantastic. Um, what collection steps would you like to see a staffing agency try before turning it over to collections? You know, that's a wonderful question, and, and, and uh, there, there are so many things that you can do, but the biggest thing that I recommend that you do with all clients, because I speak to companies um, you know, probably three, four, or five times a day, and about half of them I say, oh, you probably want to go ahead and move forward. The other half, I tell them this, have you given the debtor a specific date to pay? And has the debtor told you that they're not going to pay? They say, no, they haven't told me, or they're ignoring me, or whatever. So you give them a specific date, and you don't say 10 days from this letter. You say, on October 1st, I have to have payment in my office or, you, or call me to work out suitable, uh, agreeable uh, uh, arrangements, or we're going to go ahead and move forward. To the, uh, in, in, uh, move forward. I wouldn't go into detail what you're going to do, but draw that line and let them know the specific date. Now, the the litmus test that I utilize is if a company tells you, I'm not going to pay you because. It doesn't matter what that because is. Once they tell you they're not going to pay you, then there's no reason to give them dates or anything along those lines. You just go ahead and whether it's us, whether it's your local attorney or whoever, you go ahead and get them involved. And um, then uh, you know, start the, the collection process because anything that you send to them after that, they're not going to ask for agreements and contracts so they can look at it and see how to get you paid. If they come back later and ask for that stuff, they're looking at it, building a defense on why they don't have to pay you. So before you turn it over to us, draw you know, the line in the sand. But prior to that, and this is something, and like I said, we kind of gave a, a broad overview with the, the seven mistakes, but the reason most companies, if you have chronic companies paying you late, the reason they're paying you late is you have trained them to pay you late. And so there are certain things that you can do well before it comes to collections. Now, if you never, if you don't ever have a collection account, you're probably being overly stringent on on uh, on credit, and you're chasing away you know tons of you know potential business that uh, that would more than offset the little bit of credit risk, but. One thing that you want to do is if a comp if your terms are net 10 days, then at 14 days, send a reminder postcard with the invoices. 
at uh, at you know 30 days or at you know you know a week or two later you send a different colored postcard. You know something that we always used in uh, used to do years ago. We used to oversee credit uh, departments for staffing firms, but it just logistically grew where that was no longer feasible. But sending out these little reminders with the letters, we would we would go and have. Um, uh, postcards made on construction paper, green construction paper, yellow, and red. And our client says, oh, I'm scared they're not going to pay. I don't think they're going to work. Well, we know that they work because the checks would come back in stapled to these little postcards that we would insert into statements and things along those lines. And the second notice always uh, outperformed. And But here's the biggest thing is this is about a $20 million a year company. We started sending out postcards. Uh, the first month, we sent out probably 180 postcards. Second month, we sent out probably about 110. Third month, we sent out about 40. After that, they were sending out maybe a half a dozen to a dozen a month because these companies started paying within term. So, you know, it, it's it, the best analogy I can think about it is when you were kids and you had a bunch of puppies in a box. You always had most of them stay in the box, but you had one that constantly would get out, so you'd chase after it. When you came back, all the puppies were out of the box. So you need to, uh, there, there's, uh, you need to let the debtor know and your client know what the terms are, and if they go beyond those terms, you need to let them know that you know they're beyond terms. Is it helpful to provide a collection agency with information regarding uh, emails and the correspondence that you've had trying to collect on an account? Oh, a absolutely. I mean, we're going to need all of that information uh, as well. And, and uh, hopefully everybody's getting paid, but uh, if, if for whatever reason, if anybody needs me, you have my email address. By the way, our phone number is 800 452 Five two eight seven. I'm at extension six five seven eight. And if you let me know whether it's now or later that you are a referral from Tricom, we're going to give you our national rate of twenty percent versus our standard rate of twenty five percent. So that'll save you some money as well. But the biggest, the biggest thing, you know, we'll need that communication. But the biggest thing that we run into a lot of times is clients say, you know, the worst thing that can happen is, uh, and this happens once a week where a client or a potential prospect calls me and they say, hey, Wilson, we have somebody. They, their phones are disconnected, but I know where the owner is. Well, here, here's the deal. If you were dealing with a corporation, that debt is dead, dead, dead. It's not going to get paid because you didn't have a personal guarantee. If you have a personal guarantee, we can still go after the owners. But if you didn't have a personal guarantee, the corporation is who owed you. Uh, and if that corporation is closed down, then the owners don't owe you anything. The, the very specific reason corporations were ever created 300 years ago, the, the only reason they were created back then was to protect, protect the principles from personal liability. So if a corporation shuts down, unless you're willing to spend ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 trying to pop a corporate bell that probably isn't going to happen, that, those funds are gone. Okay, great information. Um, how large of a credit line should you give someone? There again, that comes back to what you see on uh, on somebody's credit. If you have a company that where they're seeing a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and they're paying everybody within term, and if you want to give them a forty fifty thousand dollar credit line, you know, I'm certainly not not opposed to that. I'd be secured. I'd, I'd make sure that they signed off on the paperwork and and uh, and uh, and you were UCC one if they were a, uh, especially if they were a closely held company. But what I see most of the time is I see companies extend out a fifty thousand dollar credit line without ever checking credit, and these companies couldn't have gotten a five thousand dollar credit card. That's where you get burned. Because if you have a company that, that is marginal, they may be a great $5,000 credit risk, and they may go out of business in a year, but here's the thing. They can still be insanely profitable for you because if they're running up $5,000 and then they're paying you down, paying you down, and let's say they're living up at the maximum of that $5,000 and you're at you know, whatever markup you have at the end of uh, a year, they go out of business and you lose five thousand dollars. Well, you, you probably made a heck of a lot more than that five thousand uh, dollars, and so it, it was it was still a good it was still a good deal to deal with that client. But if you had let them get up at the very end to fifty to seventy five thousand, then it's going to wipe out any of your profits for that deal and probably a couple of others. 
Okay. It looks like I have one last question uh, that has come in. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to enter them in now or um, I also put up the contact information and you can reach out to Wilson directly. Um, how can I tell if someone has been turned over to you for collections? I'm sorry, what was that? How could you what? How can I tell if someone has been turned over to you for collections? Certainly, one thing that we do for the staffing industry is we give everybody uh, access to our debtor database. It has about a quarter of a million uh, debtors in it. If you go to our website and you click on um, free debtor search and then you just, in essence, um, put in your name and your, your email address, it will, um, it will pull up. Uh, a box and you just enter in probably the first three or four letters of the company name and it will pull up anybody that has that in there. But you'll see it if you go to uh, uh, www.staffingdebt.com uh, or either aercollections.com, all of them lead back to the same place, and click on free debtor search. Uh, you enter in your, your username is your first name, your password is your email address, log on and uh, then just enter in, you know, the, I think it requires four or five letters of the company's name. I wouldn't put in the entire company name because if, if there's a hyphen or if there's a, uh, a, a misspelling or if they do it, you know, a different spacing, uh, then it won't pull it up. But if you put in the first four or five letters, it's just going to pull up. And if it pulls up too many, then you can start narrowing it down from there. Okay, great. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar and certainly Wilson for sharing his uh, knowledge about collections and how to safeguard your receivables. The recording of this webinar will be available on TRICOM's website at TRICOM.com. It will be under the Resources and Industry Insider Webinars tab. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.